He is one of only two people besides me to speak at every single New York R conference. Uh, him and Dan Chen have spoken at every single one of them, which is all the more remarkable because the next one's probably most famous for Python. And actually, now I realize Dan Chen wrote a Python book, right? But Dan Chen does both languages. And now our next speaker does too. I used to have a lot of fun trolling him at these conferences. It doesn't feel the same when we're not in person, but also he's contributed so much to the R community now, it doesn't feel right to troll him. Don't get me wrong, as soon as we're back in person, I will start trolling him again. I will absolutely have a fun time doing this just because, you know, that's what you do to a, to a good friend. You, you troll them when they're in enemy territory. But he's not really enemy territory anymore because he's contributed so much to the R community now that, you know, we can't just make fun of him for being Mr. Python. Um, so I, I, I want to sing his praise a little bit more. And I, I joke about Python, but he is the reason Python became a data science language. Without Wes, I don't think that would happen. So we all owe the data science community owes him gratitude for that. But then he's since moved on to doing even more stuff that's also been transformative of the data science community. So he's had at least two transformations of an entire field of work. So sorry if that was too much praise and not enough trolling. Everyone, please welcome Wes. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. All right. I'm live. All right, you can see me. All right, let me fix my fix my slides here. Well, I, I, uh, I regret that we cannot be together in person, but I hope to see everyone at a future uh, in-person uh, New York on our conference. I'll, I'll uh, keep my fingers crossed for, uh, for, 20, for 2022. Um, it's, been, it's been interesting to be here every year and to be speaking about very similar, uh, very similar topics, um, but it's good in that each year passes by and we have more and more interesting things to talk about and definitely a lot more work that is uh, bringing uh, value to the R community and increasing the kinds of things that uh, the increasing the computational capabilities that are available for uh, for our programmers. Um, so you know, so as Jared says, like I've become more of a polyglot as time uh, as time has gone on. But I, you know, that that was always the uh, the intention with the the Arrow project. So I'll share you some share with you some of the new things that have been going on and some of the things to expect. Uh, over the coming year and uh, and beyond that you can use now and things that you can get excited about. So for for those who uh, who are not aware, the arrow uh, the arrow project uh, was conceived to provide a language independent foundation for uh, for analytical computing focused on on data frames and and tabular data. It wasn't just created for, for the data science ecosystem, but was also intended uh, to bring better interoperability to, to database systems, big data systems, but also to provide an efficient bridge between the big data and database systems world and the data science world. And since then, you know, we've been working on doing development in the project, seemingly, you know, it feels like a long time now, but it has been a little over five years of active development. We had maybe another six months of active planning before that. So I've been working on the project for a little over six years now, um, but it's, it's grown to encompass, um, encompass many, programming, many programming languages and in, uh, happily for data science users, um, it has become one of the de facto, uh, if not the de facto standard technology for connecting uh, external data sources to the to the data science world and for getting data out of you know traditional database systems, data warehouses, uh, being able to load data more quickly so that we can work work uh, more efficiently and get more work done um, in languages that we love like Python and R. Um, I knew that starting out that that Arrow was uh, was going to be a large uh, large project that required uh, a lot of people. I started out the project uh, with a large group of open source collaborators. I was at I was at Cloudera, uh, working with with folks at uh, on projects like Impala and Kudu at Cloudera. Um, I moved to to New York in 2016 uh, to join Two Sigma because Two Sigma was really excited about Arrow and was was offering a lot of sponsorship and support for for my work. Um, but in 2018, it became apparent that. Um, that Arrow was uh, an important part of the future growth of uh, the data science and, and database ecosystem. And there were many companies, including hardware companies, other financial firms that wanted to, um, wanted to support 
uh, support Arrow development. And also um, our studio said, hey, what about, what about R? And so we, we came up with the idea to create this cross uh, kind of multi, um, this industry consortium model to fund Arrow development for a multi-year period that was, um, you know, the most of the funding came from our studio. Our studio also provided the administrative support uh, for Ursa Labs, but we were able to get uh, funding from a, a wide variety of sources and that enabled us to, to operate uh, a team of, of full-time developers building out uh, building out the Arrow project, building out integrations with uh, the data science languages. Um, so I would say that that Ursa Labs was was really successful and enabled us to to grow the project um, to to where to where it is today. We realized um, last year that to enable Arrow to reach its next stage of growth, um, that large companies, in order to ad adopt Arrow more whole wholeheartedly in their systems. Um, that there needs to be larger, uh, uh, large uh, software companies with a larger scope um, that can build products and services to support uh, enterprise adoption uh, of Arrow. Um, so we uh, we we saw a lot of we, we saw a lot of interest in in adoption of Arrow, use of Arrow, and other uh, and other software products. Uh, but the absence of uh, a software vendor, um, a uh, that, that could support enterprises through their adoption of Arrow was holding back um, was was holding back the ecosystem. So we pivoted from Ursa Labs to Ursa Computing. We raised some venture capital from uh, from our friends at, at GV uh, to fund you know, to fund our growth. Uh, so that that occurred uh, late last uh, uh, early fall in 2020, um, and we were able to grow continue to grow the team throughout 2020 and early 2021. Um, the, the thing that kept me very busy this year, uh, we, there was, uh, we saw an opportunity to bring together uh, a number of forces from the Aero ecosystem who had, um, had been building um, accelerated computational technology for, for Apache Aero. In particular, uh, computing pioneers from the GPU computing world, so folks uh, from the the uh, Rapids project, as well as Blazing SQL, which is a distributed SQL engine built uh, on top of Rapids, and so we said to ourselves, you know, we could have you know disparate efforts to create computing systems to bring um, accelerated computing for Arrow users, or we could bring all of these forces under a common a common umbrella to create uh, unified technologies, unified systems. Um, to make it uh, to to make it easier for people to use uh, to use Arrow everywhere, and so we we have called this new company kind of uh, reflecting the joining together of of forces. Uh, we've called this company Voltron Data, and we are working. Uh, we are growing a a large team. Uh, we have you know we have around uh, we have around fifty people, and we are working for the benefit of the Apache Arrow ecosystem, the growth and adoption of project, um, as well as creating optimized uh, uh, algorithms and computing technologies um, across programming languages uh, and hardware, and everything is based on Apache Arrow. Um, reflecting the change in, uh, the change in name um, and the change in our the expanded scope of our mission, uh, Ursa Labs lives on as, uh, as, as Voltron Labs, and we will continue to uh, to grow and uh, develop our open source team and our relationship with other open source projects, um, and take on and take on sponsorship and funding for for our open source uh, our open source work uh, in the the Arrow project as well as the the greater you know the Arrow cinematic universe as it is uh, now turning into. Um, so so back to back to Arrow. Um, so when we started out building Arrow, we developed a uh, language independent universal columnar data format for data frames and other and other tabular data. And the idea was to standardize the memory representation so that data could be shared portably across programming languages um, and that we could also share algorithms between uh, different computing environments. So rather than having to serialize data every time you move data between a different environment, we have a common a common data representation that can be shared without any copying or conversion between Java and C++ or Rust and Go or 
uh, Python or R and JavaScript. Um, and so that might be sharing data within process or, um, or moving data uh, from process to process. And we've developed protocols and interfaces to enable um, seamless interoperability at those language and system boundaries. Um, and the, the growth, you know, the, the growth in the community, we now have uh, a dozen programming languages represented. Um, you know, some of the recent additions to, uh, to, to the ecosystem include uh, include MATLAB and Julia. So we're very, very excited about that. And we expect that, that things will continue to grow rapidly there. Um, the, uh, in addition to the data format and libraries that we've built for getting data into that format. So many our users are familiar with um, our arrow has unlocked the ability to, to read parquet files. And so we, we read uh, data into arrow format from parquet and then we load it into R from there. Um, but Arrow has spawned a number of additional subprojects, and one that we're really excited about that I've spoken at this I've spoken about at this conference in the past um, is Arrow Flight, which is designed to be a new um, network data transfer protocol uh, to replace um, uh, old and slower uh, interfaces for moving data between systems. So, for example, if you're familiar with ODBC uh, or JDBC, we want to replace um, those more inefficient um, uh, transfer protocols, uh, interfaces to database systems with one that is arrow based. So firstly, if you have two systems that, if you have a system that consumes arrow and you have a system that can send arrow using arrow flight, then you don't have to do any conversions when you receive the data. And so we would like to see as many uh, data storage systems and data warehouse systems uh, adopt arrow as their uh, adopt arrow flight and be, being able to deliver arrow data natively um, to to arrow users, including people working in Python and R. So when you pip install um, PyArrow in Python, you get a flight client, so you can connect to flight servers. Um, we've we've uh, developed a prototype interface to flight uh, in R as well. Um, and we, we think this will be, you know, a major source of growth to make it, to expand the number of data sources that Arrow users have access to natively. Um, I would be remiss to mention that one of the things that we are actively working on in, in, the, uh, in the open source project right now is developing a standard for connecting to SQL databases with Flight. Um, Arrow uh, Flight is a low level protocol um, and does not contain any notions of SQL, like user sessions, prepared statements, and the other things that you would find if you were using Postgres or SQLite. Um, so by creating a standard SQL database middleware, we can simplify the process, not only of database vendors implementing Flight, but also as users that you have a standard um, SQL uh, middleware for connecting to, for example, you know, Postgres or another uh, SQL database system, and you get the you get the results of your queries back to you in Arrow format. So the Arrow R package uh, wraps the C++ API um, using CPP11. You can install it from CRAN um, like you would um, you know, any other R package. We've labored very hard to to make this uh, possible and seamless. But if you're interested in following the, following the upstream development, we also have uh, nightly package builds that you can. Um, that you can install and get access to the latest features. And we are always interested. Um, these are not production releases, but we, we are always interested in having uh, folks from the, from the R community engaged in the development process, giving us feedback on what's broken, like what's not working well, what's slow, like what sorts of features they would like to see. Um, and the, the major releases, as I'm about to, to mention, um, or about to about to, to tell you about, are, are a little bit slower, a little bit more conservative. So, getting using the, the nightly builds for developer uh, for developers, uh, can you can give us a faster feedback if you're comfortable being on the bleeding red, bleeding edge and seeing your your R uh, R interpreter crash occasionally. Um, all right, so. Releases of releases of Arrow. Um, we started the project in 2016, uh, and we um, there were 17 major releases up until our 1.0 release, at which point we declared the Arrow format uh, stable, um, and we moved to semantic versioning. So you you maybe have seen that the version numbers are starting to go up uh, more aggressively, and that's because we've moved to a semantic versioning uh, versioning model. Um, 
And so we do coordinated releases of most of the language libraries and bindings. That includes that includes the R package. So when you see the 5.0 version of Pyro and the 5.0 version of, of, of the R package, those we, we intend for the versions uh, to, to roughly correspond to each other. Um, and so while there, you know, there are, are some you know, new changes uh, and, and non-backwards compatible changes that occur at the API, at the, at the API level, at the arrow format levels, things remain, things remain stable. Um, 0 0.14 in 2019 was the first CRAN release. And over time, we've, we've uh, steadily been adding new features uh, to the R library, which I, I'll show you some of the new, the new features that we have. Um, and uh, we've worked to make the installation process uh, more seamless while bringing you as much out of the box functionality um, as we can without how you having to get into the details of how to build and obtain the very, you know, the many, you know, the growing number of dependencies that the Arrow package has uh, in R. So one of the, the major growth areas and, and focuses of the R package development is that we want to provide really seamless integration with dplyr and, and the tidyverse. Um, this hasn't come all at once. So we've had to, to implement dplyr verbs um, on, a, um, on a bit by bit basis. And that's because we are working to implement this computational functionality in the R, in the R package itself. Uh, so in the 0 0.16 release, uh, we, we released the very preliminary support for, uh, for the select and filter, filter commands uh, in, in dplyr. Um, in, in the 2.0 release, we brought uh, Amazon S3 support so if you have data that lives in Parquet format in an S3 bucket, you can uh, directly access that data using the Arrow package and query that data with, uh, with, with the dplyr API um, uh, using, that, using that, that support. Um, in the 4.0 release earlier this year, we, we dropped support for mutate and arrange. Uh, we are of course uh, uh, working to add as much um, it was much feature coverage in terms of what you can do inside uh, of these functions so that we have provide mapping between, uh, because we're, we're executing uh, our expressions natively on arrow data format, which is not the same as ours data frame format. And so whenever you have, because uh, these are all non-standard evaluation expressions in R. So when you write an R expression, we have to map the R function onto the arrow, corresponding arrow function. And if you use an R function that we don't support, um, you may get an error and then you can open a bug report and, or a, a feature request, uh, maybe a better way to put it. And we can implement that function and provide the mapping in the, in the R library. So you get seamless, uh, seamless uh, you know, dplyr querying capability. Um, since 4.0 and 5.0, we've rapidly expanded the functions that are supported from within the dplyr verbs to now more than 250, 250 functions. That number continues to expand continues to expand rapidly. And very excitingly for people who, are, uh, who want to crunch very large data sets in the 6.0 release, which is coming up uh, later this fall, we will finally have support for summarize and group by, which will unlock uh, a lot of interesting workloads on very large, very large data sets. So to give you a sense of like how, how, all, of this, uh, how all of this works and how the pieces, how the pieces fit together, um, so this is the base, uh, the baseline. Um, this, this example shows you the baseline performance of dplyr uh, on an R data frame. So here we're using the arrow read parquet function to read uh, a single parquet file. Um, the as data frame argument uh, asks arrow to turn the arrow data into an R data frame. And then everything from after this point, um, everything from after this point is using dplyr on R data frames to crunch, uh, to crunch the file. So we have a 10 million row parquet file, 250 megabytes. It just uses a lot of the major dplyr verbs and this runs in about uh, 1.6, 1.6 seconds. So if you, um, if you set as data frame false, when you read the parquet file, then the data is read into memory as an arrow table instead, which is a more memory, it's a more compact and memory efficient representation um, of the data in many cases. Um, and the arrow format is really optimized for processing numeric data as well as string data. So you see a lot of efficiency benefits uh, when processing a lot of, a lot of string data. Um, but here we use all of the same dplyr verbs 
uh, as we did in the, the R data frame example. And at the very end, when you call collect, it's at that point that the arrow data that's output from the, the last dplyr verb is converted to an R data frame. And so changing just from the R data frame format to the arrow, arrow format, we go from 1.6 seconds to 0.6 seconds on the same on the same data file. So we get a lot so we get a lot more efficient processing as well as a lot less memory use. So if you look at the memory footprint of this operation, the arrow version uses significantly less memory. Now let's ratchet up, uh, you know, ratchet up the, the data set size. So uh, suppose you have not just one parquet file, but a ton, like 100, or here I have 125 parquet files. So now we're not talking 250 megabytes. Uh, it's 40 gigabytes of parquet files spread across 125 files, 2 billion rows. And so Arrow has this special open data set function, which allows you to address uh, uh, partitioned directories um, of, of parquet files or CSV files. And then you can query a collection of, of these files using the same dplyr interface, uh, exactly as you would a single R data frame or a single arrow table. And what's uh, exciting about this is that we analyze these expressions and use them to, uh, to prune files from having to be scanned or to do filtering within the files to limit the amount of data that we have to decode into uh, into arrow format. And so that enables us to do direct querying on these extremely large data sets while pulling very little data into memory. And so we're able to evaluate this dplyr expression on a 40 gigabyte data set in a little over one second. Um, and this is partly fast because arrow is fast, but it's also taking advantage of this static analysis of these dplyr expressions to not scan more data than we need to. So very exciting. Um, some new functionality that's dropping. I know I'm running out of time, so I'll go quickly through this. But if you've heard of the DuckDB project, uh, another a very exciting uh, analytic uh, analytic database process, uh, analytic database project, um, you can uh, seamlessly um, transfer data uh, into into DuckDB and use DuckDB for querying. So here, when you use the to DuckDB function it returns a DB plier object. And so subsequent dplyr expressions are getting translated into SQL by dplyr and then allowing DuckDB to, uh, to, process, uh, to process the data. Um, and DuckDB has very comprehensive SQL functionality um, and supports a lot of uh, query, uh, query processing that Arrow does not yet support yet. And so this can help you, help you in your work. And it, the cool thing here is that it, it composes very naturally with all of the other Arrow machinery, including the Arrow dataset uh, machinery. So you get to reap the benefits of both worlds. So we're working uh, you know, very actively to bring uh, comprehensive uh, querying capability natively within the Arrow C++ libraries, which will um, uh, be made available to our programmers through the dplyr, dplyr interface. So you can see, you'll, you can expect to see more of these coming in subsequent releases. So I expect we'll have a lot more to talk about a year from now. And I look forward to sharing all of those improvements with, uh, with you. Um, since you know, some of you use Python and R, so you might say, well, where's all of, you know, when did the Python programmers get to, to join in on all of the fun? And some of you may be familiar with a project called IBIS, which I would describe as a kind of dplyr-like project for, for Python. And so we are working to enable the same kind of dplyr-like querying ability uh, using the, the IBIS project, which enables the same kind of static analysis of expressions that we have uh, in dplyr uh, from, from Python. So, um, so this being said, there, you know, there are you know, many uh, query engines in development that know how to process Arrow. The Data Fusion project is written in Rust. And uh, um, so that's another uh, Arrow query engine project you can, you can take a look into. My team, uh, you know, our team at, at Voltron is very focused on the, uh, the C++ project and its interfaces in Python and R. Um, but we are working to deliver uh, fluent computing interfaces um, in, you know, in, in multiple programming languages. So we will expand beyond Python and R in, in the future. So a kind of a, to last, a last item to leave you with before I, uh, I leave, since I've, I've uh, overstayed my welcome, um, but one of the problems we're working actively right now to address is the problem of fragmented user interfaces to different um, backend computing engines. So 
some engines speak SQL, some, uh, some systems uh, have their own interfaces like dplyr and ibis. And that creates this like, you know, pair to point to point problem of like, how do these query front ends communicate with all of these different query backends? Um, and that, and that creates a lot of headache for users because you have to think like, okay, what API do I want to use to communicate with this compute backend? Um, so we are working, uh, you know, with a, a, a bunch of, um, a bunch of open source developers to define and, 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 uh, specify, uh, an intermediate compute representation, which can bridge the gap between these different front end interfaces, whether data frame interfaces, default dplyr, um, uh, and, uh, and backend so that, you can choose the API that suits you best and uh, you can drive um, as many different compute engines as you have uh, available to you without having to re significantly rewrite your code. Uh, this will obviously take a long time to deliver, but something we're, we're, very, uh, we're very excited about. Um, so we're in the Arrow community, we're actively discussing this. Uh, we've getting, begun to collaborate with folks outside of the Arrow community uh, to create a common compute representation uh, to bridge front ends to back ends. Um, and so we expect that this will be an important uh, kind of element of the future growth of the, the ecosystem. Uh, so if you're interested in this, there's a new open source initiative called Substrate. Uh, you know, we're involved in this and we hope to enlist more folks from the community uh, in, in making this a reality. So thanks again for, uh, for, for having me and uh, I look forward to seeing you hopefully in person uh, uh, next year. Uh, but otherwise, you know, we, we, we love to hear from you in the Arrow, uh, Arrow community, and we look forward to uh, continuing to power up uh, data science in R. So thanks. Thanks again. So you heard it. Wes is already confirmed for next year. So good. He'll be in eight years in a row. So you got to make sure Dan Chen is there as well and uh, ready to do that.